Good day. Uh, it's great to be here with you today. I wish I could be there in person. Uh, I'm very excited to see that this event is bringing together members of the biodiversity community and the statistical community and others to really look at how do we best leverage big data in order to improve biodiversity monitoring long term. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of an update of how biodiversity monitoring is happening under the Convention on Biological Diversity and where are the needs uh, and how could big data fill some of these gaps. So I'm going to share my screen. Just give me a second. So in December of 2022, the world came together at COP15 in Montreal and they adopted the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, also known as the Biodiversity Plan. And in this decision, there were a number of equal decisions that were adopted at the same time. These have the same standing as the adoption of the Global Biodiversity Framework. These include a monitoring framework, which was adopted in decision 15.5, and a planning, monitoring, review, and reporting mechanism, which was adopted in 15.6. These are the two primary decisions that I'm going to be talking to you about and to try to explain what this means in terms of how biodiversity monitoring is, is envisioned under the convention. There was also decisions related to resource mobilization, capacity building, and digital sequencing information. Um, the capacity building and development and technical and scientific cooperation decision is particularly related because this is where a lot of the resources for building capacity on monitoring would happen. Um, similarly, under the decision on resource mobilization, there is a recognition of the importance of financing for monitoring of biodiversity. So what decision 15.6 says, this is the decision that outlines how national biodiversity strategies and action plans will be developed and how national reporting will occur. National reporting is a legal obligation under the convention. And so members of the convention, parties to the convention are legally obligated to report according to a set template. Um, and so the MBSAPs are to be developed. So the national plans are to be developed by COP16, which is later this year. And then national reporting will happen in 2026. And that will be the first round of reporting under the convention. Um, at every COP that we're going to have, there will be a review of implementation. This will include a focus on looking at um, the indicators in the monitoring framework as those become available. So the monitoring framework in decision 15.5 includes four different types of indicators. Um, it includes headline indicators. These are part of the core reporting template. There's 23 of these that are unique. Um, and these are high level indicators which aim to capture the overall scope of the goals and targets. These are going to be used for planning and tracking progress um, towards the, the major outcomes in the global biodiversity framework. And these outcomes include things like uh, protecting and restoring nature, uh, nature's contribution to people, access and benefit sharing, and, and financing. Now, there's also binary indicators. These are uh, questions with categorical answers on um, the existence of policy or administrative frameworks or legislation. And so these are similar to some of the questions in the SDG where you have indicators that are the number of countries that have something in place. Um, then there's also component indicators, which are slightly more detailed than the headline indicators. They may cover just, just a portion of a target or a goal. Um, however, in order to understand the, the overall scope of the goals and the targets, the component indicators would be very beneficial for national monitoring. And then there's complementary indicators, which are a wide range of optional um, and thematic indicators. So only the headline indicators and the binary indicators are part of the core reporting template. Um, the countries or the parties to the convention are um, encouraged to use the headline indicators and any other indicators that are relevant for developing their NBSAPs, for identifying interventions, for um, tracking progress at the national level, as well as um, providing information that can be used to track global progress. 
So then, as I mentioned, the national reports are due in February of 2026. And there's a template for reporting that was adopted at COP15 as well. And in that template, the headline indicators and the binary indicators are part of this core reporting template. And so what this really is doing is it's putting a big focus in the national reports on having data, um, which can be used to track progress. This is a, a major shift from the previous strategic plan. In the previous strategic plan, any reporting of data was optional, um, and there was no set indicators that were re recommended in the national reporting template. And so um, the, the fact that countries wanted to adopt a monitoring framework and that this monitoring framework was adopted at COP15 represents a real interest in, in having data that is available to track how progress is going at the global level and at the national level towards the convention and, and towards the global biodiversity framework objectives. And um, however, in order to make this happen, it, there's going to be a lot of steps that need to happen because as I mentioned, reporting is something that's new under the convention. Many of the indicators that are adopted um, are just at an early stage of being rolled out at the national levels. And so how we actually are able to, to track progress is something that right now there's still a lot of discussions and, and thinking through. And there was a ad hoc technical expert group that was established to, to take this forward, which I'll talk about later. And so um, then these same indicators are also to be used in the global review of progress. And the analysis will be primarily based on national level indicators. Again, this is a shift from the previous way where many of the indicators were compiled at the global level or using global models and, and countries very much wanting to take the ownership themselves and ensure that their data is flowing through and is what's used to track progress towards the, the biodiversity convention. So I'm not gonna show all of the headline indicators, but here's the indicators that are related to the first four goals of the convention of the framework. Um, and the first three targets. So in the global biodiversity framework, um, as I mentioned, there's four goals. The first is on conservation and protection of ecosystems and species. The second is on nature's contribution to people. The third is on um, access and benefit sharing. And the fourth is on finance and capacity for the achievement of the framework. And then there's 23 targets. The first eight targets relate to um, drivers of biodiversity loss. These are action-oriented targets. The, then you have targets nine to 13 that relate to um, nature's contribution to people and maintaining nature's contribution to people. And then you have targets 14 to 23, which are the means of implementation related targets, including sustainable consumption and production, mainstreaming, um, involvement of women and indigenous people and local communities in the process, effective decision making, these sorts of issues are, are tackled in those latter targets. And so I have highlighted a few targets that are um, particularly related to the system of environmental economic accounts and um, the, the statistical community. And these include the red list of ecosystems, the extent of natural ecosystems, um, the services provided by ecosystems. All of these would be based on an uh, underlying geospatial data set that could be used to compile these indicators, but also you would have the underlying data set available following the system of environmental economic accounts. Um, so as you can see, the, the demand for data in order to monitor these different indicators is going to be very large. And what we see is in many of the areas that have uh, high biodiversity richness, they're data poor. And so one of the things that we are very much looking at is how do we support countries to better use existing um, big data sets in order to roll out these indicators. And for some of the indicators like the red list that already use a lot of citizen science data, uh, there's already processes in place for pooling data from different sources into the, into the calculation of these indices. 
However, for other data sets, um, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of developing the data flows and, and finding ways that data can flow up from national level, from citizen scientists, from community-based monitoring systems into the indicators. Additionally, many of the indicators can leverage remote sensing data that's available for satellites, um, but I think that there's still gaps in terms of how countries can nationally validate this data, how do they use information that's available at the national level in order to ensure that the information that's reported by governments really is also um, the governments feel some sort of ownership of this. And so I think this is the challenge that you have in the, the meeting that you're having today is really how do you make sure that um, any of the data sets that are developed that use these big data sets, how do you make sure that they also have government buy-in and ownership and validation so that they're really useful for decision-making? There was a, a series of webinars that we conducted on the indicators that I just wanted to share the link for in case anyone wants to see uh, any of the specific methodologies on some of the indicators, you can go to this site. And so where do I think the game changers are in terms of the adoption of the global biodiversity framework versus the previous strategic plan, which was the ACH framework? Um, one, I already mentioned, the adoption of the monitoring framework was a huge achievement. There was not a monitoring framework that was adopted for national level use in the previous decade. And so the, the indication that countries really want to have such a monitoring framework is already a, a major game changer. Um, the agreement to use a set of common indicators across countries in the national reports, which are these headline and binary indicators, is also a a major shift forward as it will create a situation where um, countries are reporting at least on some common indicators and there's an ability to use national data to track global progress. And another um, changer I think that I didn't mention before is that financial reporting, which used to be separate from the national reports is now part of the same template. Um, and this also does relate to some of the indicators that the statistical community has been developing. It includes ODA, private sector finance, um, and, and public financing for biodiversity, which is very similar to SDG 15.A.1 um, and 15.B.1. And so uh, now as we're moving to COP16, which is going to happen in October of this year, what we've been working on is to ensure that these headline indicators in particular have standard methodologies, which can be used across countries, um, that they provide guidance on how do you use different sources of data? How do you use citizen science and community-based monitoring systems to, to flesh out these indicators? Um, and how do you also ensure that you're bringing in indigenous people and local communities, gender, youth into the into the achievement of the monitoring framework. This is called section C of the framework. Um, it, it discusses all these sorts of cross-cutting issues. And so the, there's guidance now available on how these are considered when, when monitoring. Um, we also have synergies with different multilateral environment agreements and the, and the protocols of the convention. Uh, so looking at how do we ensure that the monitoring of biodiversity that's done by RAMSAR or by the convention or by the Convention of Migratory Species has some sort of similarities to something else that, that we're very much looking to promote moving forward. Um, and one of the things that I think that's particularly important for this meeting and also uh, for the monitoring framework is using a consistent disaggregation across the geospatial indicators in particular, but also across other indicators. Um, and this includes using the IUCN Global Ecosystem Typology Level 3, which is Ecosystem Functional Group, to measure different ecosystem types and also to use the uh, land tenure indicators for indigenous people that has been developed um, by the, the International Land Coalition as, as ways to, to have information on these different ecosystem types and also land tenure across the different indicators. Again, in order to make this a reality, will require bringing in different forms of data, remote sensing data on land tenure, there'll be community-based monitoring information, 
And so how do we pull this all together? How do we include governments in the validation process? is something that is, is really a challenge for the monitoring framework uh, and linking with the statistical community and linking with geospatial information management systems is something that's going to be very key to, to making this a reality. Um, and all of this will require um, investment in national monitoring systems, which is something that is also part of the decision-making that's going to happen in October of this year at COP. Um, I mentioned that there's a lot of guidance that's been provided. If you go to the um, SAPSTA 26 website for the Convention on Biological Diversity, there's a series of information documents, which are just numbered here, that you can see that describe all of the methodologies for the different indicators. Um, and so back to the, the global ecosystem typology that was just mentioned, uh, there's in each country, between 10 and 60 ecosystem functional groups. And so trying to actually map those out and delineate where different ecosystems or ecosystem functional groups are occurring is something that is uh, a starting point for many of the disaggregations of different indicators. Um, and as I mentioned, this is something that will really require innovative ways of looking at different data sets. And we're working with the um, group on Earth Observation and the GeoBond and many other partners to, and IUCN and UNSD and many partners to try to say how do we actually achieve this global map and national mapping of um, different ecosystems by their ecosystem typologies. And so with that, I think I will, I will hand over to the other presenters and I know that many of them will go into more detail on some of the biodiversity observation systems that they're working on um, and also some of the work that they're doing with remote sensing. Thank you.